Last December, the New York Times stunned readers with the magnificent snowfall, breathtaking multimedia narrative that showed the possibilities of long-form journalism on the web. In Snowfall, John Branch tells the harrowing story of 16 skiers caught in an avalanche that took place in February 2012 in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. It's a six-part story accompanied by interactive graphics, video, and character bios of the skiers and snowboarders caught in the avalanche. The story was widely hailed as the future of online reading, the Times' first bold leap into experience-based feature. It was also the Times' first foray into the e-publishing of long-form singles. Snowfall, as you can see here, opens with this otherworldly video loop of snow blowing across a mountain slope. Then comes the text, beginning with an action-packed lead that foreshadows what comes next. A story of suspense and heartbreak told with perfect pacing and in riveting detail. But Snowfall is not just a well-told story. It's also, in the, world, in the words of the New Yorker, an investigation into the hazards of group decision-making and the insidious role that peer pressure, deferral to authority, and presumption of expertise can play in undermining intelligence and experience. To report this story, John Branch interviewed every survivor, researched the world of backcountry skiing, traveled to Alaska to speak with snow scientists, read accident reports, and even hiked the terrain himself. What makes this story so powerful is the recollection in their own words of each of the skiers. The Times has short video experts of each of them. One of them, Elise Saugstad, says this memorable line. It was like being in a washing machine. I didn't know which way was up, which way was down. Is this the way I am going to die? Avalanche has 15,000 words, generated 1,100 comments online, and readers spent an average of 12 minutes on the story, a record on the internet of short attention spans. It was also published in a 14-page special section of the newspaper, the Times does have a newspaper, um, two days before Christmas last year. So John Branch, how did you find this story? Um, well, thank you. Um, you know, I didn't know about this when it happened, and I got a call probably two months later. Um, when it did happen, we assigned a freelancer based in Colorado to um, write a story. In fact, this avalanche happened at the same, on the same day um, as another fatal avalanche in Washington. And so the freelancer wrote a very Timesian A1 story that said, these uh, two avalanches on Sunday in Washington um, are part of a bigger picture. Um, you know, you can sort of, you can sort of picture the lead that we typically put on these things. Um, part of a bigger, bigger picture of avalanches that have um, proven deadly this winter. Um, at that point, there had been a number, a higher number than usual of avalanche deaths. And so it was a next day kind of story. And about two months later, I got a, a call from my editor who said, do you remember that story, that avalanche? And I said, yeah, not really. <laughs> and he said, you know what, I think there's something more there. Um, you know, if indeed more and more people are headed to the backcountry, um, enticed by changes in equipment, enticed by open gate policies of, of ski areas, um, and if indeed more people are dying in avalanches, there's got to be a way to look at this in a, in a different way, not just the next day kind of way. And um, so we talked about it, and I think we both came to the pretty quick conclusion that the, the best way to do that would be to shine maybe a very narrow beam onto the broader issue. And, and, I, and I loved it, the work you guys did, as big of an issue as pipelines are, your story is probably much more interesting focused on one pipeline in part on one person as opposed to, let's do a big story on pipelines around the world. Um, so sort of with that same mantra in mind, we said, let's find an avalanche. And it became pretty clear that the one in Tunnel Creek was probably the one to do because not only was it the most deadly of the season, it was also one in which there were a lot of survivors and witnesses. And most avalanches kill the people that set them off and uh, they don't have a lot of witnesses. So it's one thing to find an avalanche, it's another thing to report it. How do you report on an avalanche that took place, you know, like several months after, uh, before you even, even thought there was a story there? Yeah, uh, nothing like reporting a story on avalanches in the middle of the summer. Um, <laughs> the first thing I did was, besides doing some very basic um, 
going back and seeing what was written about this was to make a couple calls to people who were in the avalanche. And I just started calling them. And I didn't know what kind of response I would get, certainly. It had been two or three months since the avalanche. I would assume that they were tired of um, thinking about it, talking about it. Uh, they didn't know me from anybody. And here's another guy, just another reporter, calling him saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you again. Can we go over it all again? And fortunately, um, the first two calls um, were Megan Michelson and um, John Stifter. Both of them are actually members of the media, and they responded to my request within an hour or two. And I had them both on the phone for several hours each, going minute by minute through what happened that day. And you know, at the time, I, I assumed that I would be able to get a, hopefully a few people to talk about the avalanche. But it, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that in the end, all of them, we figured out who was there, which was a trick in its own. And in the end, they all spoke. Um, but I do think it, it took a certain amount of trust, and it certainly, this is a horrible analogy, snowballed to some extent that I talked to them. And when I went to make the next call for the next person, they were certainly calling them and saying, hey, Megan, what do you think of this guy? You know, I don't want to talk about this again. What do you think of this guy? And fortunately, over the course of a couple of months, they all agreed to talk. So how, how do you talk about something you know, tragic like this? How do you even begin the conversation? You know, um, the thing I did with them is just ask them if they would just walk me through the entire weekend. Um, I believe it happened on a Sunday, and so I said, you know, why were you there at Stevens Pass? You know, tell me when you got there. Thursday? Friday? What were you doing? Walk me through Saturday. When? And really, minute by minute. And it was a little bit excruciating for some of them to really kind of recall everything that led up to the, the event. But one of my first missions was to, was to sort of build a timeline uh, of what happened. Um, you know, after you get 10 or 12 or 13 people talking about the same event, um, I was trying to think, well, if you guys left that group, at what point did the avalanche occur? Where were you when this happened? Um, it became a little bit of, of a feat in trying to, to really figure out chronologically exactly where people were on the mountain at exactly what time. There were some GoPro camera footage. There was some GoPro camera footage. There were text messages. Um, there were 911 calls. There were some ways I could sort of construct a timeline. And that's what I did first, is basically took all the information from the interviews and cut and pasted all their quotes about what they were doing at each moment mm -hmm. and cut it into a huge file. So um, your chronology was minute by minute? Was as close to minute by minute as possible. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and once I got to the avalanche, yes. Um, so the interviews were all very, very detailed. I wanted to know every minute by minute what happened. But you did more than interviewing. You, you did other things to get this story done. You even went to an international snow science workshop. Yeah, um, which I didn't know that existed. The, uh, <laughs> at the International Snow Science Workshop, which I missed in Grenoble, France recently, I don't know why I didn't get to go to the next one, um, was in Anchorage uh, last year. And there are 700 or 800 um, snow scientists from around the world that convene. Um, it's, a, it's an entire world unto its own. Um, it's not all people who are interested in backcountry skiers. A lot of them are people who um, are into construction of railroads and um, highways and people who are town planners and mountain communities who are trying to figure out, can we build here or are we just setting ourselves up for danger? Um, it's a fascinating world. Yeah, I did spend four or five days in, at the conference. And then you climbed the same mountain. Well, yeah, what was interesting is that um, where this avalanche took place is um, was is really difficult to get to. You know, you can't get to it in the summer. The lifts aren't running for one thing, um, but the the ski area at one point did let me did open up the lift for me, and I went down there with uh, two guys. We went to the top, hiked up to where the top were these guys, and then we hiked down as far as we could down into the ravine. And separately, I started at the bottom and hiked up from the bottom. I really just wanted to get a sense of the terrain, and it's brutal. I mean. Um, it was, I'm from Colorado, so I, th I think I know mountains a little bit, and it was really difficult, treacherous terrain, and it really was kind of a funnel. I mean, you could sort of see both the allure of it, because it was beautiful, um, but also the, the treachery of it. So this project took six months, a team of multimedia and visual journalists, 14, 14 pages, 15,000 words, that's a lot. I mean, isn't this, I mean, I don't mean this in this way, isn't it a bit of overkill? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we get that question a lot, um, and I, I'm probably the wrong person to answer it. You know, when I started, it was go check out, do a story about an avalanche. Um, it began very organically. 
um, Steve, who will, I think, talk about this in, your, in a few minutes, knows that I basically took this file of interviews that I had, that it were all basically cut and spliced into a chronological um, story or a chronological uh, thing of 30,000 words. And at some point, I went to my editor and said, just in case you're wondering if I've been busy the last few weeks, I sort of felt guilty, like they haven't heard from me in weeks. And I, I sent them that file. And they read through it, and they actually, for a time, thought we could almost run this, just nothing but people talking about it. Um, it was 30,000 words. That would have been a little much. But anyway, they, they passed that file, which is kind of unusual for us. They passed it on to other departments, including Steve, including the uh, video department, our, um, our photo editor, um, and said, hey, John Branch is working on this. We think there's something potentially um, powerful, and, and we're going to go pretty big on this, we think. Are you guys interested? And to Steve's great credit, Steve said, yes, of course, we'll do it. OK, Steve, why don't you come up and show us how you did it? Take us behind the scenes of um, Snowfall. So I'll just run through the presentation of it and give you a little bit of the backstory. It does start with this kind of uh, signature moving still. Um, it was one of a series of short videos that uh, Catherine Spangler edited. Uh, she was the main video editor on the piece. And so with the, the top of the piece, we just try to keep things as minimal as possible. You don't see navigation until you scroll down a little bit. And the, the general idea was just to push the multimedia as close as possible to the words. Um, here we'll see Elise talk for a little bit. I had no ability to control what was happening to me. I, I was being tossed over and over and over. It was like being in a washing machine. I didn't know which way was up. I didn't know which way was down. I couldn't see anything. Um, there were times when I couldn't breathe because there was so much snow and there was a, it was just like void of air. I definitely thought that after being caught in it for a little while, holy moly, this, this may be the end. I, I, this is it. This is, are you serious? This is really the way I'm going to, to die? So then you continue to scroll and you kind of get to the section that is really, um, I think, one of the better moments where the browser starts to darken and you're reading about the Cascade Mountain Range and then you're in the Cascade Mountain Range. And this is a motion graphic created by a member of the graphics department, Jeremy White. Uh, it's just a digital elevation model that he extruded uh, and then he draped satellite imagery over that and there were some other effects he applied to it and then he created the animation. But the sort of merging of um, you know, the words with the multimedia was really the, the main uh, sort of conceptual leap. Um, and it started, you know, here. Um, <laughs> sort of a simple idea. So those black <clears throat> horizontal bars represent multimedia elements and, and the vertical bars represent words. Um, and, you know, it, it was a little bit of a leap because ordinarily we, you know, this is how we present multimedia. There's a written story and then there are, uh, you know, what some people refer to as bells and whistles. We, we don't refer to them that way. Um, you know, along the side, but they're separate. You know, no matter how compelling the multimedia elements are, they're, they're unto themselves um, and not part of what uh, people in the newsroom talk about as the story. Um, so the idea here was to not have separate stories, but to have one story um, and to create, you know, only multimedia where it was going to be, you know, function as connective tissue um, between sections of John's story. Um, and so I'll show you another, another part of the piece. It starts out with another sort of moving still. Um, and then here we show you a, um, a reconstruct basically of the avalanche. Um, it was something that we created from data actually. So we show you where the, the skiers were on the mountain and <coughs> include some contour sound. lines. What and so we added a little sound. The sound actually is, there's a little data component to the sound because it's ticking off every time it, it, 
it crosses another hundred feet. Um, a little annotation on the speed. So you get the idea. And you know, it started with, with this. Actually, I think the source we worked with, uh, with someone John found was this, this Swiss group that does avalanche research. And they, they do modeling of uh, avalanches. And we had a lot of information, you know, the physical attributes of this. We had the sort of width of the crack and the depth, and we had this very detailed uh, elevation model, so we knew the slope and variations in the slope, and so we passed them our data and the model that we created, and, and they started to actually create an animation out of it. Um, and so they gave us the velocity and the height of this at different, at different positions down the, the slope of the mountain. And then we mapped that to our 3D model. You can sort of see the stages of it here. And then we started to kind of stylize it and simplify it so that it um, became something that was understandable. And then we you know, included uh, scales and annotation to make it a little bit more meaningful. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll take a few minutes of questions on Avalanche and then open it up to all the entire panel. All right, there's an avalanche of uh, questioners here. Yes, please, go ahead. Hi, Jenny, again. Um, yeah, of course. Everyone saw this when it came out, and people are still continuing to talk about it simply because we haven't seen it duplicated yet. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about maybe, Steve, what are the challenges, costs associated with everything that goes into making a project like this, and why maybe it is such a special thing right now? And, you know, we haven't seen something like this since last December. Uh, well, there were a lot of challenges, um, although at the time it didn't seem that difficult. We had a lot of time to work on it. Um, there was no real peg, and we kind of kept pushing back the publication date because we were developing assets and you know, became more and more confident that they were going to be good and that we had a good idea for how we were going to put it all together. Um, I think you know, the challenge in repeating it is that uh, you know, we, we turn around stories pretty quickly, even stories that have a lot of people working on them, even stories where we're, you know, creating a lot of multimedia. And, you know, with this piece, it was sort of a luxury to have the amount of time that we did. Um, and so it let us, you know, try things out and, and have those things not work. Um, and with other projects, we're having to turn them around so quickly that it's hard to experiment the degree that we did with, with this project. Yes, and that's it. Hi, um, I have absolutely no digital training and uh, I'm a reporter, but every time I look at this project, I wonder what did John Branch do? And I see that there was a huge team uh, that was supporting him. But as far as we are concerned, when there is this growing you know, uh, concern about being a one-man army and being able to produce something like this, what, what can you do? What kind of skills can you learn to produce something as terrific as that? And uh, yeah, how do you go about it? Well, I mean, there were maybe a dozen people working on this. So, um, you know, there was a video editor, there was a, a photographer, Ruth Fremson, great photographer. Uh, there were 3D modelers and animators. Um, you know, I mean, which, which path would you like to go down? I mean, there, uh, and, you know, of course, it's, it was all tied to what John was doing. I mean, none of this would have happened if, you know, we didn't have a great story. Um, we, you know, if, if there wasn't the sort of openness uh, that John had with his reporting, you know, the sort of raw reporting that he opened up and gave us a start creating some of the multimedia elements, I think that was like a, a crucial thing. Um, so, uh, you know, as a reporter, certainly one thing to take on in thinking about how these things become possible is to not be so uh, guarded about the material um, and that there are others who can contribute uh, you know, elements that will, that will, you know, improve the quality of the piece ultimately. I, I've sort of joked that you should probably try to be born like 10 years later because, if you can help it, because um, I'd imagine these, some of these graphics that took days or weeks to construct in 10 years might take a shift. Um, 
and maybe people, they'll be so easy in some way. I mean, I think we'll laugh at, you know, we'll look at this and kind of laugh at how long it took and how everybody seemed to love it at the time, and now it'll, it'll, look, it'll look quaint at some point, <laughs> as hard as that might be to believe. Um, yeah, but I, who, no doubt, I think with technology, and Steve knows better than anybody, I think it's changing so quickly that people will be able to do this kind of thing probably sooner than we realize. Um, uh, I, have, I have two quick questions. Um, one is, when you were sort of building the narrative and actually structuring the piece online, um, what was the ideation behind putting certain multimedia elements at a certain place? I thought that was quite interesting in terms of how the, the entire thing was curated. So just, just something on that. Um, and the second thing is, is the idea of sort of this being touted as the model. For, for multimedia journalism going forward, six months, um, I don't know, 15 people, I don't know how much money was spent on it. It's something pretty much the New York Times or the Washington Post can afford. I don't think most of the other newspapers here can afford to put that sort of resource. Uh, given that, do you, having created this, really think this is the model for multimedia journalism going ahead? So um, I'll just <clears throat> answer your first question. Uh, and just give you a little um, backstory. Uh, when we started to talk about the multimedia for the project, um, I mean, we, when we when we launched, we behaved the way that we ordinarily do. We we wanted to make a model of the mountain. We thought there was a graphic that would be that would be separate from John's piece that we would make some kind of a simulation of the a recreation of the avalanche. Um, and you know, we we started to see video and some of the photography and and the the models, the graphics that we were making started to improve, and we kind of realized that they they were going to be pretty strong, and started to talk about what we were going to do with all of this material, um, and you know, the idea surfaced that we would try to bring them all together, and and we thought that meant, you know, changing some of the written story um, that we would want. Uh, the, the multimedia to be like to be like connective tissue to be a part of the story and so we sort of presented this idea to Joe Sexton who was the sports editor and Jason Solomon who's who is now the sports editor and said look you know in order for this to work in order to bring all of this together and make a story it means editing it means us editing the multimedia so that it so that it so that when you experience it it is like reading and it means us editing your words so that they they lead you into the multimedia uh, in a very natural way. And Joe Sexton said, no way. Uh, that was it. And so then it took a couple of weeks, you know, to let him mull it over. And I think ultimately, I don't even know how he became convinced that it was maybe a good idea. Um, but he said yes, and then in the end, we actually didn't end up changing any of John's words. You know, we got a draft, and and the stuff that we were, the pieces we were making, fell in line, sort of just right uh, in different places, and and uh, it became obvious where to put things because um, of the way John, you know, structured the narrative. Things just seemed they were logical. They 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 were a good fit in different different places, and. I don't know if you want to talk no, about that at all. John's question <laughs> was, is, is this a model? Is this the future? No, so, or is it so only the second, for the time? So yeah. I think, it, it, I mean, Snowfall is not really a model. I mean, the, the way that we made that project is not has not been a model really uh, for projects that are sort of similar that we have done since. Um, I mean, except uh, the idea. You know, there, there, this year we've run projects on you know, there was a there was a science piece on on the uh, the quest to find the Higgs boson, and there has been a series by Libby Rosenthal about uh, the cost of uh, you know healthcare in this country. And uh, we did a piece recently. A, a reporter took a trip from St. Petersburg to Moscow and sort of documented her you know story and what she found along the way in a similar way, and it was at a lower scale. And so we're turning around this idea of of bringing the multimedia into the, the written piece and, and uh, editing the multimedia so that it is not sort of take you on a tangent. And, and also thinking about seriously, you know, talking about and uh, at times doing it, ex you know, changing the, the written story um, so that it can accommodate. Well, that, those are the lasting, you know, sort of effects. Um, so in terms of it being a model, it has become sort of a model, but not 
the level of production that, that Snowfall had. So that side, please. Yeah. John, you said um, your editor assigned you to this story, but can you talk a little bit about finding a story that already has been done and identifying that there really is a lot more there and how to report on it in a way that is that we still care um, and that's not repetitive? Yeah, um, you're right, because it had been done. And in fact, during the reporting for this, I found out that Megan was writing a first-person account. And of course, you know, at this point, multimedia might have been involved. And I said, great, we're going to be writing a story that we have nothing, that we are going to try to report months later. And meanwhile, there's going to be a first-person account in Outside Magazine of somebody who's actually there. How am I going to compete with that? Um, the, I think that the, the key was that we were willing to kind of go deep. That's another avalanche cliche um, metaphor. We were, we were willing to do more than just a news story. Um, we really were invested in doing, you know, we want to know the emotions. We want to know exactly how it all came together. We wanted to weave together 16. It turns out to be 16 different stories, basically, and try to weave them together. Um, there aren't a lot of news organizations that are probably going to do that. Um, 17, I think it was closer to 17,000 words. And there was some debate in the newsroom whether it's actually the longest story, single story that the Times has ever run. Um, you don't go into a story thinking it's going to be 17,000 words, but it just sort of evolved that way. And, and I think that's kind of the key here is that we didn't have any preconceived notions with a story or with the multimedia. This all just sort of grew. And in, to use that word again, it, it really did snowball. It's like, this is good. And fortunately, there were editors, and Steve being one, and, and Joe Sexton being one, and Jason Stallman, and then ultimately Jill Abramson, who said, this is so good, we're not going to mess with it. Keep going. Yes, please. Uh, this is a question more for John, and you've touched on this a little bit, I think, in some of your responses, but I was wondering if you could talk, uh, having gone uh, through this project, if or how that has affected your compositional process or how you think about a story, um, having had your text you know, become the basis for this much bigger um, collaborative multimedia project than had been seen before. You know, the short answer is that it didn't. Um, I had written most of this. You know, I had that huge kind of chronological draft um, of all the interviews, and I used that as kind of the uh, as kind of the skeleton for how I built a story. In the end, I ended up doing it mostly chronological. Um, so, in some ways, don't tell the Pulitzer board this. This was kind of easy to write once I had all that reporting done, because it was kind of chronological and it followed what I'd already had already kind of constructed um, with the reporting. There was, I did get the phone call, I live in California now, I did get the phone call from Jason Stallman saying, you just missed an interesting meeting. Steve says, Steve says, you got to trust us, we want to build these multimedia components. What it might mean is that you might need to train, change some of the transitions, we might need to cut some of John's text and try to make it all work so that the, the graphic elements basically replace the words, it's all going to be one blended thing, to which Joe Sexton, I, I can't believe he said something without a lot of swear words. But, um, <laughs> And so he basically had my back. And so there was discussion whether or not we were going to really blend and sort of make and have the writer write this differently because of multimedia. In the end, nothing changed. Um, I don't know if that's happened since then. I'm involved in a couple projects now that I could potentially see we would write it for the multimedia. Yeah, that, that was my question is, like, has it changed your compositional process now? It hasn't. I'm working on something now that Steve and I were talking about before this that I could see I'll go into a writing it, you know, maybe it's a, a, a bunch of vignettes and I'm picturing how it would work in multimedia as opposed to one long narrative. Um, I think we're right at that cusp. Um, I think this is an interesting time because as reporters, I think we are now, you know, I've always thought about how would, you know, what could we do to add video to this or, or a photographer? Um, what kind of graphics would be useful in this? But as Steve showed, that used to be separate little things and now we're blending them together. You have to think about how it's going to work out. And I think we're kind of at that point. And it'll be interesting to see over the next, what, five or 10 years as more and more reporters sort of get told, guess what, your text is changing because of whatever. And there was talk early on, not to belabor the point, but there was talk early on, for example, about whether some of my quotes would get cut, some of the quotes would get cut, in favor of that person actually talking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're not quite there yet with all of a sudden somebody's head popping up and, and voice coming on. I don't, you, know, you notice you still have to click on the, on the play button. And I think you know, maybe the reader's not quite ready to have somebody just suddenly start talking, or maybe they don't have the volume turned up. You know? um, but those are the kinds of, kinds of discussions that we're having. June? 
There's a quote making the rounds among the executive classes of the media that <clears throat> this project costs damn near a million dollars, and because of that, the Times would never do anything this extensive again. I'm not going to ask you to verify that quote or not, but can you talk about the lessons that you learned, both of you, from doing this and how you're applying it to the projects that you're working on now that do involve multimedia? I don't see how it costs that much. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this well, is going on. I mean, so was it a million? <laughs> I, well, so the group that that built the the project on the web um, did not work on this exclusively. I mean, there were other projects that we were juggling. It was 2012, so we had a presidential election, and there, there were a lot of news events we had to cover as well. So. It wasn't something that we were, we weren't just spending our time working on this. Yeah, um, if, if there's one regret I have in terms of a line in the story, it's actually the postscript, which said 16 people worked on this for six months. Some of those people worked on it for a few days. Some people did it off and on over the course of a couple months. Um, I was probably the only one that was involved for, to some degree, for six months. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off. But no, I think, no. fortunately, we happened to work someplace where we didn't, the two of us at least, didn't have to worry about the cost of it. Um, somebody above us did. I don't know. We maybe just didn't tell them what we were doing. I don't know exactly how that all worked out. I don't think anybody's added up how much did this cost. I don't know if there's a way to add that up. Um, and I certainly know that we are not going to try to write stories to make money. You know, we see this in a, in a much broader picture than that. Um, you know, if you had to go out and, and sell a story to make money for the New York Times, most of our stories would not get written. So the lessons learned, I think, extend beyond the, the graphics department or the video desk or the photo desk uh, to the newsroom generally. I mean, it goes back to what John was saying, where he's now thinking about stories a little bit differently. I think the project um, and some of the, the some similar projects that we've done since then have caused reporters to want to be involved in the creation of um, visual elements and and has you know, generated discussion around the newsroom about how, you know, the, the value of those elements. Um, and so I think the, the lessons learned are just a sort of shift in the culture, the newsroom, so that it's not, we're still obviously going to be generating thousands and thousands of words in the New York Times, but, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a lot more consideration sort of given to the value of uh, visual sort of interactive journalism going forward. Yes. You just talked about, or you just said that you don't write stories to make money, um, which is kind of a comfortable position you put yourself in because if small newsrooms want to tell long form and multimedia stories, they need to make money. And I wondered if you at any point talked about advertisement, um, generating advertisement revenue, because I think advertisement would kind of decrease the quality of the piece. And um, so, I mean, there's the model the Edivist has where you pay per article. Um, what other ways um, would, could you think of or would you think are possible um, to make those stories um, um, generate money and to, 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 to finance them? Yeah, my point about the money, I, I want to be clear, is that I don't think we'd be in a good position if we set out to write a story and this individual story needs to make money. That's probably not a story most people want to read. It's, it's you know, I'd hope to think that we would like to look at it in a, in a bigger picture where um, the collection of stories that we produce will get subscribers, will get um, advertisers, that sort of thing. It was interesting, and, and Steve probably knows more about this than I do, but it was interesting to have a meeting with our new publisher shortly after Snowfall came out. Uh, there, was, there were discussions during the making of this about advertising and whether advertising should be sprinkled in. Um, in the end, there were, what, four? Just a few ads. Yeah, there's a few ads that kind of go across. Two weeks later, we had a meeting with the publisher um, and our new CEO, Mark Thompson, and we were talking about all this, and he said, you guys, I loved it. I'm the new CEO. I absolutely loved what you did, but why in the hell did you guys put ads in it? <laughs> Which is not something you would think a CEO would say, but his point was there should have been, you know, you, maybe we gummed it up a little bit. You had something beautiful, and maybe we shouldn't have done that 
maybe there's a different way to look at it. Maybe we could have sold a sponsorship for it. Or maybe you just have what might be a lost leader. This is going to bring attention, positive attention to the New York Times. It'll get subscribers in that way. You won't actually see the money. No, no accountant can figure out how much money did this cost and how much did it make. So we did, I'll just mention that we did run a long form piece this summer about, it was a profile of a jockey and that piece was sponsored by BMW. Um, but the, the people generating the, the piece um, didn't have a lot to do with selling the article. I mean, it's not our jobs to sell it. It's our jobs to, to make the stories.